lot of these videos that I make, I'm either I am either going to work or I'm doing something work related, business related. And it's kind of got me to thinking about jobs I've had and I think most people once they reach a certain age, very few people stay at the same job their whole life anyway. I think everybody's got at least that one job that is kind of their their job their job related horror story that job that if you you just absolutely would refuse to go back to it. I'm just wondering to get, give make this your opportunity to to rant or to uh, to vent because uh, I think everybody's got something that you know like, just just assume for a second that whatever income you've got now ends this place calls you up and says hey we'd like for you to come back and you basically tell them you would rather starve than to go back to that job because I have one the job I had well technically the job I had I had two different jobs for that company it was really the first thing I started off as but it was this company as a whole you're gonna hear my, my chair squeaking every now and then just in case you're wondering uh, it was my job as a telemarketer that is, that is not employment that you really want to do. That is just scraping the bottom of the barrel of employment. But when I agreed to go to this place, I didn't know I was going to be a telemarketer. Okay, basically, we're going back to uh, the mid-90s here. Well, there was this person. I'm not going to say who this person was, just because I don't want to. <laughs> but it was a person that conventional wisdom would say with someone I could trust. In reality, I should have known I could not trust this person. But uh, I had heard, I, I had pr I'd pretty much written this person off as someone who was never going to do anything. Well, then I started catching wind that they had, well, I, I first heard they were working in an office. And that's all I heard. That's all, all that well, it was ever explained to me, an office. And then, Next thing you know, I heard they're running this office. I'm like, wow, okay. Well, they contacted me and wanted to know if I wanted to come to work there. And the way it was explained to me was this office, which was in Wichita Falls, Texas, was a branch of, there's one of several offices this guy owned, a guy from out of California. And this guy uh, was involved with the entertainment industry. He had worked with several bands. Probably the biggest name was Van Halen. He was associated with Van Halen. And in Wichita Falls, it would, they would bring in these entertainment shows. Sometimes it would be a you know, magic show. It would be uh, plays. It would be just all these different things. And as it turned out at this particular time in Wichita Falls, the powers that be in Wichita Falls have always desperately wanted Wichita Falls to be recognized as something more. They, they wanted to be like a Dallas suburb. They wanted to make themselves like a, a Frisco or an Allen. Uh, and this was when they were really starting to push it. And they were doing a pretty good job. Over the, the next few years, they were bringing in some pretty big names. George Carlin came in, uh, David Copperfield. Uh, they had a Star Trek convention that came in. And all of this was just starting about the time I got this word that I could co come in and go to work. And so I thought, well, maybe that's part of this. This sounds like a really good opportunity. Now, I might have to get some, some nicer duds. And, you know, of course, I didn't have a lot of experience as a writer. Maybe I could work my way into their PR department, something like that. It, it really just seemed like a really good opportunity. And so I, I made a mistake. I just sold the farm, so to speak, and jumped in with both feet. What I should have done was go check it out first, but I trusted this person that was telling me all this and selling this thing to me, so to speak. And I show up, and okay, the, the apartment building, I got, I got there and... The apartment building wasn't what uh, what I pictured, but it was okay. Uh, it was kind of on the edge of the sketchy part of town. 
But I was like, well, it's just an office building, isn't it? Walked in, fairly decent office building, okay. Went to their office, opened the door, and the front part of the office was this tiny little room. And there's the person that I'm talking about sitting there. He walked through that room into the bigger part of the room, and there were the other employees. And I will say that as I got to know some of these people, these were basically, basically good people. But there's not one of them that said Van Halen. <laughs> okay, this, this was not what I was expecting. Uh, the people that worked here were kind of a story in, in themselves. And maybe I'll, I'll talk more about them later. Because there are some interesting stories that happened in that back room. But it wasn't until I got there that I found out what the job was was telemarketing and yes the office was owned by a guy out of California that was involved in the in the entertainment industry and did have connections to Van Halen and so on and so forth this was basically a tax write-off for him that he probably spent more on lunch than than he made off of this office and so now I'm stuck it, I, I stayed there for two and a half years. I ended up becoming a, a delivery driver, which was a little better, but it was still just awful because you were just stuck. You, you weren't making enough money to stay. You weren't making enough money to leave. And, of course, like an idiot, there, there, was, a, there was a time it, it got pretty tough, and I decided to show loyalty to this person that asked me to come in. I don't feel that loyalty was ever uh, repaid or recognized. I had my opportunities to leave and I, I chose not to and that was again a mistake of my own. But basically what, what this stuff was, was uh, your success at this particular type of telemarketing was uh, based on how well you could lie, you could just flat out lie to people. This guy in California, or his people would contact someone there in Wichita Falls. It would be like a, an organization like, uh, you know, the JCs or Lions Club or one of those kind of organizations. The excuse we used was we were basically paying them to use their name. So when we got on the phone and called people and said, I'm calling on behalf of the Wichita Falls, whatever, that's what we were paying them for. Now, we never actually took any money from them. You know, they never paid us to do anything. Everything came out of the money that we brought in. So they made money just for doing nothing. But it's still the fact of the matter that we, we would call people trying to make them think that we were with the Wichita Falls JCs or the, the Lions Club or whatever group we were working for. And they would donate. Like say individuals might donate 20, they might donate 100, they might donate even more. They would donate this money thinking that we would, they were donating to these organizations. And by the time all was said and done, by the time the telemarketers were paid and the expenses were paid and, and all of that, maybe about 8% of that would actually go to the organization. And then plus one of the stories we would tell is we would say, well, we're we're having this whatever. Uh, like one of the first one that we did was actually one of the things that kind of fooled me into thinking it was a big deal is it was a thing called the Dallas Cowboys alumni. Now after I got involved in it, I found out there are two different organizations. There's the Dallas Cowboys alumni and then there's the Dallas Cowboys legends. The Dallas Cowboys legends are a group made up of people like Roger Saubach, Tony Dorsett, Troy Aikman, the big name Dallas Cowboys. Well, the Dallas Cowboys alumni was anybody that had anything to do with the Dallas Cowboys ever. If if you were with them in training camp at one point in 1981 and you got cut after two weeks, you could be part of the Dallas Cowboys alumni. Well, we had the Dallas Cowboys alumni coming in for a charity basketball game. And this guy, and I'll go ahead and give his name here, a, a guy with this company named Jack Hallmark. 
I give his name because he is nothing but a liar and a con man, and if you ever have to deal with Jack Hallmark, run. He actually came in and took over the office at one point, and he would have us change our story so much, it got to the point I didn't even know what I had told people. At one point, at one point he was telling, well, tell people that it's going to be guys like, you know, Roger Staubach and Tony Dorsett and Ed Jones and uh, these big name Dallas Cow former big name former Dallas Cowboys, and then it became okay. Tell them it's going to be the current Cowboys. Tell them it, because this was happening like in February. Tell them it's going to be the the current Cowboys, but we don't know for sure who all is going to be there because we have to wait for the season to end, and they won't release who all is going to be there until after the Super Bowl. This that and the other, and so we were telling people it was going to be the current players, we were throwing out names like Emmett Smith and Bill Bates and Troy Aikman and oh. and of course a lot of people, I'd, I'd call, you'd call them early on, they'd say well call me back when it gets closer to the event, you'd call them back, you couldn't even remember what you had told them and then plus a lot of people showed up expecting to see either big name former Cowboys or big name current Cowboys and then out walks Roy King who I don't even know who Roy King is John Dunton was there. He was, you know, I knew who he was, but I know a lot of people there probably didn't. Probably the biggest name there was Everson Walls. He was a former defensive back. Other than that, it was, you know, Everson Walls, John Dunton, probably the two biggest names. The rest of the guys there were nobodies. They were, they were, like I say, they were guys that, that maybe were with the team for two or three games in, in 1983 or something, and nobody knew who they were. And in a town like Wichita Falls, which is, you know, has been at about 100,000 people for the last 50 years, it is a very small town mentality in Wichita Falls. And so the next time we did a show, you'd try to call people, and a lot of them would be like, you know, we just got this thing with the basketball game, and they lied out their butt to us, so we're not, we're not giving no money to nothing. It was just awful. And I said, I tried the delivery drive, and that was just as bad. And then you had to see these people. You know, this, this little old lady coming to the door with a cane and handing you a $20 bill thinking she was helping the Boys and Girls Club and you're taking it knowing that maybe, you know, $3 of that is actually going to go to the Boys and Girls Club. Well, like I said, it was about two and a half years that I did this. Almost starved myself to death because I was hardly making any money. As a delivery driver, you got uh, $2 a pickup. But you had to pay all your own expenses. You had to pay for your own gas and all of that. Uh, it was it was bad, and there's no possible way I would want to have to do that again. So, uh, what's your horror story? What's what's the job you did that you would never want to have to go back to? Because uh, that one's mine. <laughs> all right. Well, I hope you enjoyed that story. I'll be back next Monday with another drive. If you uh, are new to the channel. You click the one-way sign in the bottom right-hand corner. You click the circle at the beginning, or at the end, rather. Or uh, the red button, of course, on the front of the page. Pretty sure you know how YouTube works. And if you're a returning subscriber, thanks for watching till the end. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.